people listening to this, I would just like you to perhaps start thinking a little bit for yourselves and don't outsource your thinking to government experts uh, because they don't always have your best interests at heart. Oh, blimey, I come from a, um, a strong footballing family. Um, my brothers, I have three older brothers who were all very good footballers. My dad was a good footballer. I had uncles who were very good footballers. Um, so it's only natural that I was going to be a, uh, brought up in a very sporting family. So that's kind of where it all started, really. Why did you play for Southampton all your career? Why was the no move? Different things at different times, really. Um, family circumstances. Uh, you know, I enjoyed being the big fish in the small pond. Felt like I owed Southampton. You know, they gave me my chance to be a, a professional footballer uh, and to fulfil all my dreams as a, as a kid who just wanted to be a footballer and play for England. Um, I managed to do all that stuff while at Southampton. So, um, yeah, I felt like I owed them something as well. The fans were always brilliant to me, treated me brilliantly right from day one when I, when I burst on the scene as a youngster. Um, uh, and you know, I always felt a bit of loyalty towards them as well. Did you ever get any offers to move and was, that, was you ever close to moving at any stage? Yeah, I nearly joined Spurs uh, when I was 21. That was my team as a boy. Um, I was a Spurs fan. And they were the only team that I ever actually spoke to, uh, had conversations with them, uh, so very nearly joined. It was only the fact that I was just about to get married uh, and um, my fiance wasn't keen on moving to London, so I made the decision to, uh, to stay at Southampton. Liverpool and Chelsea came in for me after that. Um, but I was happy where I was uh, and I didn't see any point in moving. Do you think you would have got more England Cups had you moved? I think I would have probably have had more chances with England if I'd have moved, yeah. Um, but that, that, that doesn't mean that I regret staying at Southampton at all. Uh, I have no regrets about the decisions I made in my career. Who was the best player you ever played against, Matt? Best player I ever played against, uh, certainly in the Premier League, was Thierry Henry. Um, I think he made the game look very easy at times. Uh, and he often made it look like he was an adult playing in kids' football sometimes. So uh, he, for me, would be right up there. And I also got to play against Roberto Baggio um, in a pre-season friendly back in the early 90s. And uh, he was a pretty special footballer too. But recently, there seems to be a lot of cardiac arrests amongst football footballers and sport, sports athletes. Mm. Why do you think that might be? Um, well, uh, there's, a, there's a whole raft of excuses that we've seen or reasons that it might be in the papers. Um, but none of them uh, want to admit that it, that it possibly could be from vaccination. They don't even want to consider that possibility. Um, it could be that, that people have had COVID and uh, this may be a, a long-term effect of, uh, of the virus. We don't know. Um, and unless proper studies are done, uh, then we're never going to know. So um, that's why I've been quite vocal in calling for some uh, studies to be done into it and, uh, and to find out why this dramatic rise in, in heart problems with fit young, uh, not just footballers actually, it's a lot of sports people, a lot of fit young sports people who have collapsed on their various fields of play and I think it needs investigating. And, and would you say the number's a lot larger now than it was back in your generation? I, I don't recall uh, a single player in my generation that I played with or against uh, having uh, a heart problem either in training or in a, or in a football match. Um, not in 17 years of my time at Southampton Football Club. So yeah, I, I'd say it's, uh, it's quite a noticeable increase. And going back to England, what do you think of England taking the knee prior to every match? Uh, I, I think it's a pretty empty gesture. Um, quite frankly, I think there are, are better things that we can do um, to try to uh, promote what they're trying to promote. Um, uh, and so I, I think it's, it, it's had its time. It's, uh, uh, it's almost become a little bit divisive now as well, um, when it, that, sh that shouldn't really have to be the case. Why was you, I guess, cancelled from Sky Sports? I, mean, I wasn't cancelled, I was sacked. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's slightly different. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the way that Sky have gone with their, with their policies um, meant, I think, that it wasn't a very good look for them to have uh, five middle-aged white men on a programme. Um, uh, and so uh, the diversity... Uh, angle that, that Sky have gone down, um, it meant that uh, you know there was going to be changes afoot and unfortunately we were one of those changes. From research and other interviews, I, I was made aware that you didn't want to wear the BLM match um, prior to a game. Why was that? Because I um, had done a bit of research into what Black Lives Matter stood for uh, and I wasn't comfortable uh, aligning myself with, those, with that organisation. Um, I felt like they could have used uh, a better slogan. They're, they're, they've kind of tried to detach themselves from the organisation, but by using those three words, 
uh, I think they very much linked themselves to that organisation and I think that was a mistake uh, when it happened. Uh, and I think it, they could have used a different slogan to promote what they were trying to promote. Uh, and what response was you given by a corporation like Sky when you refused to wear the badge? Or you um, well, I, I, first of all, I was asked um, if I would wear the badge. This was about a minute before we were due to go on air. Um, so we weren't really given a lot of time to uh, have any discussions about it. Um, but at the end of the show, after I'd worn it, I felt very uncomfortable. Uh, and I went to the producer of the show and I just said, I, I won't be wearing this next week. Um, you know, I'm prepared to wear any other, uh, the kick races amount badges, I'm prepared to wear anything like that. But I don't want to align myself with that particular organisation and those particular words. What was his response to that? Uh, his response was, yeah, that's fine. So I wore a, a different badge the following week. And then, and then what happened? Uh, and then uh, a few months later, I was sacked. But I have no idea if those two things were uh, connected. Did they not give you any more information as to why, that, why the sacking was there? Uh, no, I was told that the programme is going in a different direction. That was, the, uh, that was the reason that I was given, and that was the only sentence that they gave me uh, after 15 years of working for them. And how has that affected you moving forward? Uh, it's been quite liberating, uh, actually. Um, I've managed to uh, find work with uh, other people um, and other people who value freedom of speech um, and don't mind you having an opinion that goes against the, the mainstream narrative. One person who's got an opinion that goes against the mainstream narrative, who I interviewed recently, um, Tommy Robinson, how do you feel about his cancellation? Because he's pretty much been deplatformed. Yeah, I think censorship in any form is wrong, um, quite frankly. Uh, I, I think the whole freedom of speech thing in this country is, is the most important thing we can have to pass down to our uh, generation of, of children. Um, uh, I think that it's a dangerous society when you start having the censorship and the online harm safety bill that's trying to go through Parliament at the moment um, because it puts too much power into people's hands, into, it concentrates power into, into the hands of the elite and the, and the government and that's power that can be easily abused as we've seen many, many times in history uh, and we need to learn from that. But where do you think we're going, I, I guess, as a country or a community um, in regards to like post-Covid with the elites? Um, do you think it's almost turning into us against the elites? I think there's a, a, bit, of a, a bit of an awakening happening um, around the country. Uh, I certainly have seen uh, a shift in attitudes uh, towards the rules that the government were trying to enforce upon people um, and more and more people are, are now actually um, certainly coming up to me uh, in the past year or so and, and just asking different questions than what they were asking maybe 18 months ago, two years ago. Um, so there's, there's definitely a shift in attitudes and I think they've overplayed their hand. Uh, I think they've made it pretty obvious what their goal is uh, and people are not standing for it. I really uh, have lost a lot of faith in politics uh, over the last few years. Uh, I'm not sure there's anybody that I could uh, shout a name out from the Conservative Party, um, certainly from the front benches, that would make this any better. Uh, quite frankly, I'm not even sure uh, that they're actually the ones making the decisions in this country. Um, I, I think uh, somebody described it to me very well uh, when they spoke about the, the Labour and the Conservative parties when they said they're just two cheeks of the same arse. Um, before we finish, is there anything that you would like to say? Um, no, I, just, I, I would just like to... Um, people listening to this, I would just like you to um, perhaps start thinking a little bit for yourselves and don't outsource your thinking to government experts. If you give full authority, your, your full compliance to people in authority, then history has showed us they will abuse that authority. So question authority. Thank you for your time, Matt.